truth and reconciliation? And how does that inform the way you go about developing your research program, working with your community, working with underrepresented groups? So I include that always at the beginning of every talk, but also as a, an example of how to apply principles of EDI. And down here in the uh, lower right corner is our Aboriginal elder, Joanne Delaire, holding the wampum belt, which represents the treaty and which represents a different way of thinking about governance. So this is part of your trainee program for Glyconet. And, and I was interested to find out more about what was going on in terms of trainee development. And so I took a look at this great little video that's on YouTube. And it, you can see that Glyconet is committed to and responsible for for effective training of HQP, and that's an NCE requirement. And so what does that mean in terms of professional development? What are the skills that you are learning as a trainee? And obviously you're learning skills around uh, academic science, you're learning about things like how to write a paper, how to design experiments, how to present the importance of your research, um, maybe how to develop an idea into commercialization, um, how to pitch an idea, how to patent. Um, some, some people on that video talked about business analysis and a whole bunch of other things that you're learning as a set of skills as a trainee. And so when we think about EDI skills, then that's really another set of skills that you need to acquire. And this is a, a graph um, that comes from um, some work done at University of Toronto, which shows that um, while many uh, uh, PhD students from, this is the University of Toronto, go on from life sciences into um, academic or post-secondary, then there are many, other, many also going on to, into other professions of physical sciences or other kinds of public sector or even uh, NGOs and that kind of thing. So, so you have a set of skills as trainees that you want to take with you into other um, professions. So whether you go on into an academic career, academic science career or industry or other, uh, type of career, then um, understanding and applying the principles of equity, diversity, and inclusion in any of those uh, professions or any of those career pathways is really um, an element of the core competencies that you take with you. So you have core competencies around skills related to science and research, experimental design, data analysis, but these days more and more core competencies around understanding EDI and being able to apply EDI as a business tool, as a way to leverage human capital, as a way to improve the quality of your research. Um, this is increasingly being looked for by all sorts of employers, both in academic science and, and beyond. So for example, I just came back from um, a whole uh, review panel at NSERC where we were reviewing um, uh, and so discovery grants, and this is now built into the review process for the evaluation of your research grant. And NSERC, for example, has in its guide for applicants um, how to go about considering equity, diversity, and inclusion in your application. How are you integrating that into your research plan for your trainees? So in your application and whether you're whether you're going to um, NSERC or to CIHR, then you're going to be expected to be able to explain why in your, um, in your research proposal, um, you, why and how you're paying attention to um, EDI, but also particularly in a CIHR context, how you're also paying attention to sex and gender-based analysis. So I mentioned a little bit about NSERC and CIHR. I'm going to come back to that. But I also wanted to mention the fact that if you are a trainee going on to, for instance, an academic tenure track position, uh, you will also be asked for evidence of your ability and your understanding. So maybe even before you get to write a grant, then you apply for a position. Um, and this is a statement uh, paragraph that's taken from a real world uh, tenure track position posting and you can see that along with in the rest of the job ad there will be um, you know must have demonstrated excellence in, in research and a teaching portfolio the final paragraph says candidates must have a demonstrated commitment to our values of equity diversity and inclusion as it pertains to service teaching and scholarly research or creative activities and include demonstrated ability to make learning accessible for a diverse student population and evidence of commitment through a diversity statement. So 
Um, so evidence that you actually know what this means, but also evidence that you've actually done something um, that demonstrates that you understand the, the, these core competencies. Um, so in your application, for example, for a position, you would need a diversity statement of some kind that might refer back to your institutional equity, diversity, and inclusion statement that, that your institution will have. Every Canadian post-secondary institution has a statement, a commitment to EDI. It was part of the Universities Canada commitment last year. They were all required to have them. They're all posted by December 2018. Um, so you can take a look at that to see what the values and the principles are. You would need to amend that for your own purposes and then have examples um, of how you um, are actually, how you've applied that. So if for a search committee, then you're going to have to convince that committee how EDI is integrated, for example, into your research. So if you're a life sciences researcher and you're using mice or rats, and you're studying um, hormonal control of uh, behavior, or you're looking at drug development, and, and you want to be sure that it's going to be um, an effective drug for the widest possible population, then you must be able to demonstrate that you understand sex and gender-based analysis, plus, um, and how you build your research teams, how, how you um, ask questions. And when I've got little red stars here, it means that there's homework for you to go away and Think about because these are all things you can follow up on and learn about. In terms of teaching, how do you develop an inclusive and accessible teaching environment if you're going into a tenure track position um, and you're going to be teaching first year biology or second year biochemistry? How do you make sure that people from different backgrounds and different socioeconomic sectors or people maybe from international backgrounds um, can um, have as much opportunity as people who maybe look like you and came through a, a process or a program that was very, um, very conventional. And in terms of EDI in service, <clears throat> what does that mean in terms of collegiality? Do you know what implicit bias is? Do you know what makes for a good committee structure? Do you know what it's like? Um, have you read anything about what it's like to be an underrepresented group in, in science? And so these are things that that people are looking for now. These are core skills that trainees need to be getting. And you are probably not getting them from your PIs or your uh, institution necessarily because you know, people of my generation, we didn't get trained in these things. These things were never paid attention to. And so it's the job of organizations like Glyconet to provide this kind of training. So as I said, NSERC, well, let's say you've got your job now. You, you then go and you want to write a grant. So NSERC says, Okay, show us also how you are integrating EDI into your application, particularly in your training design. And CIHR now has made this sex and gender-based analysis considerations mandatory. So you must be able to include those. You must know what that means and be able to include that in your experimental design. Um, so SGBA plus is mandatory for CIHR. SGBA plus and research design and EDI and HQB is a bonus for NSERC, but I suspect in the next year or so it will become mandatory. So again, these are core competencies, it's a skill set you must have in order to, to write your grants. Um, so for instance, um, how are you going to improve on this? How are you going to be sure that you have these skills? I can't give them to you in a 45 minute webinar, but there's lots of resources out here. And, and look, CIHR has provided a great um, resource here about why science is better when you understand sex and gender. Um, so it's important that trainees, that all of us learn the lexicon or the vocabulary of EDI, sex and gender, and we understand what those words mean and how we use them appropriately in a scientific context. And this is a great resource. You can just go and download it. It's a PDF and it explains to you um, the importance and the relevance of sex and gender based analysis. It tells you the difference between sex and gender. And I can tell you, I came back from CIHR reviews in December and NSERC reviews in, uh, in February. And there are still many scientists out there who use these terms incorrectly. Um, and as scientists, you know, we, we have rigorous standards. We, we strive for excellence and we need to be sure that we understand the systems that we're that we're working on and, and the relevance of these particular characteristics to the systems that we're working on. 
This also is from this little booklet. It gives examples of um, why these things are important. The X chromosome has 16, nearly 1,700 genes. The Y chromosome has over 400. But only 33% of genome-wide association studies, GWAS studies, and there's a lot of those out there, include the sex chromosomes. And that's a lot of genes that are being missed in terms of trying to understand genome-wide effects. Um, high throughput uh, phenotype data, sex hormones, and, and the way that they, that they may impact um, responses to drugs. Uh, increased cannabis dependence in females and opioids suppress testosterone in males. So we need to understand how sex um, and uh, gender, female gender is, is independent of female sex, is associated with a higher recurrence of cardiovascular events. So sex and gender play a role in a whole variety of sort of healthcare settings. Um, and, and I often, uh, not often, I sometimes get um, scientists pushing back against these kinds of talks because they think that I'm pushing some kind of feminist agenda and that as a woman in science, somehow this is all about women in science. And I'd just like to point this out that this is actually a study carried out by two top-notch um, researchers, men in science in Canada, Dr. Michael Salter in Toronto here and Jeffrey Mugel in uh, Montreal and showing the um, the difference in uh, responses to pain um, in uh, in different rodents um, in in male or female rodents um, and and demonstrating how important it is the implications in the field of pain research um, and how important it is that we think about how we integrate uh, sex and gender um, EDI into our uh, research design we get better science. Uh, this is just a reviewer sheet to help reviewers with NSERC. So I just thought I'd show you this because this is what sits in front of reviewers when they're actually trying to look at grants. And you can see that one of the things in terms of merit of the proposal is, has the researcher actually put this into the design, if applicable? Has the researcher built EDI into the plan? It's not listed here as such, but it's, it's an expectation. It's, it's, it's a bonus. And this is the CIHR. This is actually what the, the, the proposal actually looks like, grant application. So this isn't for the reviewer. This is what you fill out when you're writing a grant. And uh, sex and gender-based analysis in the research field, you have to fill in this section. Is sex as a biological variable taken into account if you're using rats, mice, if you're looking at human cells? Have you taken gender into account if, if appropriate? So these things are what you will be expected to... Um, to know about. This is a skill set. This is a competency. Um, and people say, well, it doesn't matter because I don't work on rats or mice. Um, but if you work on cell lines, then do you know the sex of your cells? And a classic example of where people sometimes have got into trouble is with a cell line like HeLa, which is a, um, derived from a woman uh, of African-American descent um, who had cervical cancer. So there is an ethnicity and a sex associated with that cell line that may uh, impact the behavior and the, and the, and the uh, outcomes of how that uh, cell line behaves or, how, or what happens when it's treated. So it's important to understand these things and it makes for better science and you're a better scientist. Um, so, the, so this is me. I'm a reviewer for all three tri-councils and in the last six months I have reviewed more than 10 CIHR projects out of a pool of about 30 where four are likely to get funded. More than 40 NSERC discovery grants in the life sciences where each grant gets about 15 minutes of evaluation and several SHRC institutional major projects where universities were looking for $10 million chairs. So you need to be thinking how you can demonstrate to me as a reviewer or me as a committee member on a search um, committee that you have the awareness relative to your research around sex and gender-based analysis and that you've integrated equity, diversity and inclusion into your research plan. So it's a skill set needed for funding as an individual, as a team and as an institution. We have plenty and plenty of examples of where failure to inc incorporate diversity into science and medicine leads to bad science, where failure to have diverse teams has led to really poor quality outcomes. And this is a good example from um, pharmaceutical sciences. Heart disease kills mostly women, so why are they excluded from drug trials? 
This is bad science. This is bad medicine. Other examples are artificial intelligence, technology. Um, uh, this is an example of drug trials, and there, were, there are many, many other examples. And again, if you want more uh, information on particularly gender or sex, uh, ge binary gender-based um, problems with low quality um, science or lack of rigor in science. And there are a couple of great books. This came out last year, Inferior, How Science Got Women Wrong, and the new research that's writing the story. And this is just released um, last week, Invisible Women, Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. And it's not about pushing an agenda. It's about trying to get the best possible outcome for everybody. And when you fail to, to take into account, in this case, 50% of the world, then you lead to poor quality outcomes for everybody. And so we want, we, we really want the, the best possible outcomes because we are rigorous scientists. Um, so how can you do some of these things? How can you integrate EDI into, for instance, your plan? Well, what is EDI? Let's just go back to thinking about what are we trying to do in terms of um, building EDI into our research plans? If we, if we assume now we, we understand sex and gender-based analysis, think about your rats, think about your experimental design, think about the questions, make sure that you're doing rigorous science. But in terms of EDI, what are we, what are we trying to, to think about here? And when we think about equity, diversity, and inclusion, we're talking about who gets to do science? We're, talk, we're thinking about fairness. Equity is fairness. We're thinking about who has access. So this is a, a, a slide I use just to represent. These aren't actually my family members. This represents the background I came from. My mother <coughs> grew up in the slums of the north, northeast of England, long line of miners. My father grew up in rural England. Um, all my grandparents left school or didn't finish school by the time they were 14. Um, and my parents could only go to university because of changes in policy as a consequence of post-Second World War legislation. So they were poor kids, and poor kids didn't get to go to university until barriers to access were removed. And so we're talking about who gets to do science. My father went on to, to be a very successful scientist and got national awards and worked with trade and industry. And, um, but he wouldn't have been able to do that had it had barriers that were socioeconomic not been removed. So if we don't leverage all the human capital there, if we have people who can't get into science, then we're not getting the best quality science. We're not, we don't have everybody doing the science. We limit who defines the problems. We limit who asks questions. We have a structure that says some people aren't welcomed. We don't have diverse teams and we have lower quality outputs. And that's not what we want. We want more and better science. So that's what equity, diversity and inclusion is really striving for in terms of the design of the kind of research and the science that we're doing. Or even if you go into business or industry or other kinds of um, areas, the same principles apply. This is just a set of data from, um, it's actually the US population, but it kind of shows, it goes to show the, the, the diversity of, of um, people that we have and the numbers won't be that different for, for Canada. So 30% um, white men, white women, um, but, but a whole range of other individuals. And when you look around your room or you look around your institution or you look around your program, Think about who's actually in your program. And if we'd looked at the demographics of undergraduate um, programs, or if we looked at the demographics of downtown Toronto, or we looked at the demographics of downtown Vancouver, we would see that perhaps who's doing the science and who's asking the questions and who's leading those projects doesn't necessarily look like perhaps what you would predict it should look like based on what our actual mix of population looks like. So, and, and that's important because we may be missing something. So challenging the status quo is not a bad thing. There are different questions that might be asked. There are different approaches. Groupthink is a very serious problem. Groupthink is a very serious impediment to good business, to good governance, to good science, to good problem solving, to good decision making. So groupthink, regardless of where it is, can be a, a, a barrier to excellence. And obviously, you know, you've heard this term, I'm sure, that um, we lose people along the way. And I, I hate, personally hate the leaky pipeline metaphor because it's actually that people are, are pushed out, people are, are um, 
people are not welcomed into the sciences. So it's not that they're dripping out because they can't make it. It's actually that there is, it's exclusionary. Um, we hear it a lot about women in the sciences, but the reality is if you look at minorities, uh, underrepresented groups, you'll see the same characteristic. So it's not a gender issue. It's actually a, you don't look like a scientist issue. And that means that we're losing people from that great kind of rich spectrum of humanity that we actually have and who have good ideas. So it's not a leaky pipeline. It's a glass obstacle course. It means that there are barriers in the way. And this is what understanding the principles of EDI means. It means that you understand that the world is set up in a way that some people have privilege and advantage and some people don't. And we need to understand that. We need to remove those barriers and ensure that people have access. And it's not just a gender binary issue, which I see a lot of misunderstanding in this country, that when we're talking about uh, diversity in science, then it's all about getting more women in the system. It's not that. It's about getting, it's about leveraging human capital and human potential. And barriers, bias, prejudice, stereotypes exist about people of color, people with disabilities, people from the LGBTQ community, First Nations, poor people, older people. And these are just some examples that I show to represent people who have made um, significant contributions in the sciences, but um, were Stephen Hawking to have arrived in the world um, and from the start of his scientific career, um, been, uh, been like this um, in a wheelchair using a mobility device, then possibly he would not have been able to contribute the way he has, the way he was able to, because we have um, stereotypes about people with disabilities that because they have a physical disability, they must have an intellectual disability. Well, not at all. If you're in the medical device development R and D industry, then you cannot possibly be effectively developing any technologies without including this community because they are the experts. They have to be part of your research teams. Um, similarly, this is my friend Anthony Bonato who tweeted this in advance of a conference. As a gay mathematician, I was always on the outside. I never had role models or advocates. And now I do when I came in as dean because I was very active um, and very vocal about the importance of being inclusive to members of, of this community. Um, and if we think about what happened to Alan Turing, um, you know, what contributions might he have made were he not um, to end his life prematurely as a consequence of being a gay man. Um, I also, it's worth noting with, with Anthony that he, or he's an internationally um, regarded mathematician and was asked to lead um, a session on a prestigious uh, conference um, but he will not do that because that conference is being held in St. Petersburg in Russia and he does not feel comfortable, rightly so, or safe to be able to go to that conference. And therefore that limits the ability for him to contribute because he's a member of this community. This is Mahadeo Sukai, who literally wrote the book on creating a culture of accessibility. He is legally blind. Um, and there are other kinds of barriers that we we have in society. So these are the things you want to get out of the way in terms of um, thinking about EDI in science. Who's missing? Who are we not hearing from? Who, is, who doesn't have their voice? Who are we not making space for? Um, many people will have seen this particular cartoon, which differentiates between equality and equity. It's a problematic cartoon because the people that can't see over the the fence are um, short people. So it uses height as a metaphor for oppression. And that means that if you can't see over the fence, it's because you have some kind of deficit. Well, that's actually not the case. We're talking about people who have privilege, have advantage for whatever reason, people like me, uh, I'm white, uh, I have a British accent that is very um, conventional, that gives me a lot of privilege, so I have a lot of, lot of advantage. People who don't talk like me might have more skills than I do, but they have they're at a considerable disadvantage because maybe they're not white, uh, maybe they're a woman of color, and we know that those people are already dealing with with structural systemic prejudice, bias, um, and stereotypes. So we're we're trying to recognize the the barriers and get them out of the way. What are the things that might be existing in your environment that um, create a problem? Um, could it be language? Could it be um, uh, could it be how you how your social events happen? Could it be that uh, people who are the loudest tend to be the ones that always dominate the conversation? Are you making space for people who are more um, come from cultural backgrounds that maybe are are less overt in terms of how they speak? 
Um, are you recognizing the, the, the differences? Are you seeing people for who they truly are? Um, and these are more examples. Manufacturers and designers used to be all men. It didn't occur to them they should be designing for people unlike themselves. And, and I will say all men and right-handed men. So many design fails don't take into account uh, the fact that a proportion of our population is left-handed. And there's a lot of detail here. Um, artificial intelligence and machine learning has a huge white male bias. Some horrible examples of poor um, quality facial recognition and um, Google Translate is a, is a well-studied um, male bias. And this is just an example. So just going back to this example I used before about uh, drug development, uh, it's kind of interesting that when I did the screenshot, uh, one of the things that I captured in that screenshot was a scrolling um, ad banner uh, that says, de-risk your clinical trials of machine learning. And we know that machine learning is full of bias, so it hardly seems that it would de-risk the clinical trials. So things to be aware of, things to know about. Um, and so things that... Uh, um, so, so things that we need to be aware about when we're um, designing research and the most effective way to design, to ensure that your research take these, takes these things into account is to have a diverse team. Um, and we will get better quality uh, outputs when we have a diverse team because you have people will come in with different ideas. They will come in with different perspectives um, and they will come in with, with um, with more challenges. Um, and there's a ton of scholarship, a ton of data on, uh, the, on the fact that this is a fact and that we want to then use this as a way to improve our science. Um, so when I talk about you know, developing a, a diversity statement, for instance, or applying uh, or writing an insert grant or, or explaining to um, Roche Pharmaceuticals or Roche, that big multinational drug company, which is very, very proactive in terms of uh, an inclusive environment, um, how do you do that? How do you as a trainee do that? Well, you need to define your principles and you need to understand those and you need to, to, to um, engage with them. So a principle like then might be the diversity makes for better science. It makes for quite better questions and better dialogue. So that's a principle, but how do you actually action that in terms of how you're going to go ahead and build your team, let's say, or, or um, um, contribute to a division or a department or something like that? And the action could be that you're going to seek out underrepresented groups through non-traditional recruitment techniques, for instance. Um, and so this is what people do. They don't rely on just the usual kinds of ways of, of um, responding to students. We know from a lot of studies that students with white sounding names get more callbacks um, when they apply for graduate school than do students from other communities. So being intentional and seeking out other ways of finding perhaps students who wouldn't think that they were worthy students that come from poor backgrounds, um, using conferences or contributing to conferences and making it clear that uh, you're expecting there to be a gender balance or that you're expecting there to be um, an inclusive environment. And, and so the principles followed by the actions are the, the ways that you'll apply those skills and, and demonstrate that there's evidence, um, that there's evidence for you knowing how to do it. Um, places where there are barriers, and this is very important to think about and to know about reasons that we don't see diversity are that we know that there is bias in how CVs are evaluated. And, and just remember that men and women are biased in these evaluations. CVs can be evaluated with bias, implicit bias, and sometimes explicit bias, basis of gender and ethnicity. We know that there's bias in how, how uh, people cite themselves and others. We know there's a lot of bias in invited talks. We see this all the time at conferences when the whole conference is, is um, just one gender and one ethnicity. Uh, we know that there's bias in letters of reference. A lot of research has been done on this, tons of data. And so when all of these things are factored in, are we really getting the best out? Because we know there's bias in the system. So meritocracy on the basis of these traditional metrics is, is a myth. Um, and there was a special issue of The Lancet that came out just uh, this month that has a lot of detail about um, all of these various aspects. So these are things to keep in mind, not because we're evil people, we have bias, because we're human beings. But to show that you're EDI aware means that you understand these things. 
And it's important as a good scientist to understand these things because you wouldn't accept uh, the output from a series of machines, all of which you know very well and that have been well demonstrated to have inherent bias, and then you get compounded bias. So out, we're striving for the best that we can possibly get. Um, and why would we be accepting outputs from systems that we know are biased? And we have shown through, through research are biased. Um, I think one piece that we often miss or we're not paying enough attention to in Canada is the fact that this makes us all feel very uncomfortable because we're going to have to talk about who's not in the room. And we're gonna have to talk about the fact that that conference panel is all old white men. And we're gonna have to talk about the fact that um, maybe somebody um, comes from a different background. Um, and this makes us uncomfortable. And uh, it's a very un-Canadian thing in some ways. We don't want people to be comfortable. We want people to get along. But work from many people, including Sarah Kaplan at U of T, um, has shown that discomfort's good. Discomfort actually leads to more innovation. It's part of the process of applying EDI principles. And actually, some of us that have had very diverse teams know this from experience. When you have very diverse teams, particularly language diverse teams, people from different parts of the world, you have to present ideas more clearly. You have to clarify concepts more thoroughly when you're dealing with uh, five or six people for whom none of them is English, a first or a second language. Um, and so discomfort um, and, and that tension can actually lead to um, uh, a, a, more, a more clarity of thought. Um, but it's hard work. So, and, and it's, it's persistent work and you have to keep at it and you have to practice it. So embracing diversity and inclusion effectively, it's hard work. You have to do the work. Uh, it's a skill set. You have to learn the skills and you have to be able to demonstrate and you have to practice. But it's all worth it because the outputs are better and the, and the innovation is there and the value, value proposition, money, um, you know, outputs, grants. Do you want a grant? Do you want a grant with a lot of money? Then, then make sure you write your EDI component in your HQP well. So it's worth it. Things that you can do, understand the vocabulary, call it out. Everybody can be an ally for someone else. And if your institution isn't running allyship kinds of events, then uh, you can ask them, graduate students, um, postdocs, learn how to be allies, um, learn about microaggressions, all of those little things that people will say that cut it, that just chip away. And the way that you can challenge that through micro sponsorship, the way that you can just say something to step in, be an ally, step in and say something that sponsors somebody. We need better. We need to stop having uh, seminar series in departments that are all one gender. We need to um, ask people, hold our institutions um, accountable. And uh, we need to be positive. We need to celebrate all of the contributions made by different people from different kinds of backgrounds and be intentional and engage with it. Just because you don't come from one of these communities doesn't mean that you can't help out, step in, step up, sponsor, champion, be part of that. That is evidence for your application of EDI principles. Um, tons of communication, get involved with science societies, listen to what people have to say, listen to colleagues, listen to women talking about their experiences in science, listen to what it's like to be a young woman of color in chemistry at U of T and be the only person that looks like you and wonder why you're there and then have people tell you you shouldn't be there. That's Eugenia Duido's story from U of T. Um, there is a strong community. Um, there you can be involved with. Glyconet's doing a great job in that sense. Look to people who are doing the kinds of things that you want to do, that you want to be like men and women. There are great role models out there, great male leaders who demonstrate what inclusive leadership really looks like. Everybody can be a champion, cheer on others. Everybody can be a sponsor, nominate somebody for an award. Everybody can be a mentor. If you're a postdoc, mentor a graduate student. If you're a, a, a new PI, mentor a postdoc. Help them get that first job. Um, and be prepared for the fact that people are uncomfortable. People will get uncomfortable. They'll get defensive. Sometimes they'll get downright hostile. Anytime privilege is challenged, somebody's going to feel um, like they're going to lose something. But ultimately, it's actually on all of us. It's all of our responsibilities um, to act on this. Think about this algorithm, awareness. Become aware, become aware of the barriers. Look around, who's not in the room? 
who hasn't had a word. Look at who speaks up. Look at who asks questions at a conference. Look who's on the panel. So start to look through at the world through an EDI lens. Be aware and be aware of the impact on your research. And then educate yourself about what the issues are. It's not a pipeline issue. It's not because girls select out, self-select out. It's not because people of color can't do science. Okay, educate about what the issues are. Learn about what the actions are that work. We do a lot of stuff in this country because we think it'll work without actually looking at the evidence. And then look for the outcomes. Does it change the outcomes? You know, did you write a great EDI component into your grant and did you get the grant? That's a good outcome. Otherwise, get help. Find out how to do it properly. So those are, uh, that's an algorithm to sort of think about can be helpful. And there are things that you can do depending on, on where you sit in the hierarchy. Um, this is particularly for um, uh, um, men and white men, white women. Um, learn how to be an ally. Uh, everybody can be an ally. You can be an ally uh, to, if, if you're straight, you can be an ally to the LGBTQ community. If you're a person, if you, if you don't have a disability, you can be an ally to the, to the community for, uh, of people with disabilities. Um, learn about toxic masculinity um, because it's an issue. This is a workshop that, on the left here that is done at uh, University of Waterloo for um, engineering students specifically. Um, how do you respond to sexist comments? Because that's something that, um, you know, young, young engineering students, how do I respond to sexist comments? Um, I, I want to be an ally. I need to learn how to do that. Um, understand your own privilege. You know, maybe you didn't have any barriers. Maybe you have parents who went to university, so you, you ha already had an advantage of knowing what it meant to go through the process of going to university. But for kids of first generation, uh, at, at university, it's a very, very complicated, difficult, challenging uh, world to navigate to even get to university. Check your own biases, ask who's not in the room, ask who has not had a voice. Make space. One of, some of the best advice I got was from a, a colleague who is um, Cree, um, First Nations, and, and her advice, of, she was on a panel that I was running, her advice was share the platform. Share the platform, make space for people who maybe are not there or not, don't have a platform or don't have a voice and listen, listen and believe. So demonstrating core competences is an in effective application of EDI principles is increasingly an important skill set that employees are looking for in everyone. And this, I've heard this from companies like Microsoft and Linux and IBM and Roche and um, all the universities. So these are core skill sets that doesn't matter who you are, male, female, what, where you sit, it's a set of skills that you need. And that's really all I have to say. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Ko, for that really great presentation. So we have had a few questions come through. Maybe we'll begin with a couple of science-oriented questions. In its series on Canada's data gaps, the Globe and Mail recently wrote about gaps in racial data in areas such as health research. Can you mm -hmm. comment on the role of racial and other data in the application of EDI? And Will CIHR be adding other dimensions of diversity to its strategic plan? So, yes, absolutely. Canada, unlike um, our neighbor to the south, um, has a, a real poverty in data. Um, we have cultural um, differences in terms of how we view personal data. So much of the data that we have is gender binary. Um, and uh, she's absolutely right. Josephine's absolutely right that we don't have um, as much uh, sort of racial or ethnic um, data as would be useful. Um, whether CIHR is planning to include that, I don't know, but certainly uh, the tri-councils are very interested in trying to improve the amount of data that the universities um, collect and the, the amount of data that's used to inform research and to inform policy. So I think there's a general sense that yes, we absolutely need more data. Um, we need more data about um, racial background because, as I said, there are differences in um, in aspects of disease. There are differences in aspects of um, uh, response, that kind of thing. And there are some people who are working in this area. Juliet Daniel at McMaster is a is a great lead who's discovered a um, predisposition to a certain type type of cancer in uh, women of Caribbean background. 
Um, and the real expert in Canada on this is Melinda Smith at the University of Alberta, who is tracking um, the numbers of uh, men and women of color in, uh, for instance, university leadership positions and um, you know, who gets awards and that kind of thing. So um, we, we tend to continue to default to diversity being gender binary, and we really have got to push much harder on getting the community broadly defined, science, research, universities, R&D, to understand that when we're talking about diversity, we're talking about a whole spectrum across all genders, across all ethnicities. And that is what we're talking about. It's not women in science. It's about, a, it's about, human, about humanity and the richness of humanity. So absolutely, we need more data um, and we need uh, disaggregated data, um, which we don't have enough of. And, and there are best practices we can look to um, as to how to do that better. So also related to sex and gender-based analysis, is sex and gender-based analysis only for health-related research or does it encompass other areas as well? Um, no, it, it, it's, it's all areas. So if you're looking at public policy, if you're looking at, um, uh, if you're looking at um, infrastructure, if you're looking at um, design, technology, um, it needs to be done with a, a sex and gender based um, uh, lens. Um, we cannot improve the lives of men unless we move towards more gender equity. And you'll find articles about that in The Lancet. Um, you can also look to uh, people like Michael Kaufman, who's just written a book on why gender equity is good for men. Um, and, and, it, and it comes to things like policy. And I, I, here's a great example. Canadian Coast Guard, of all places. You wouldn't think the Canadian Coast Guard is a great progressive um, institution, but it is. They were continually trying to improve their work environment for um, women. To, get, to make it a more, um, um, more attractive um, career destination for women. How can, we, how can we redesign our equipment? Women tend to have slightly smaller hands than men. Much of the equipment on the ships is, is designed for the average man, and so it's harder for women with smaller hands to um, manage some of that equipment. So that's a challenge. So why don't we redesign the equipment so that, so that it, it can be used by everybody? They just, and they did this, and they discovered that it also improved the ability of men who are left-handed to use that equipment. So when you work towards gender equity, um, you end up with policies and processes and structures that are good for everybody. And so sex and gender-based analysis uh, or a gender-based um, analysis or a gender-based lens through which you look at design, through which you look at policy development um, is, is almost always gonna improve the outputs and the outcomes. Maybe I'll follow that one up with, uh, what are examples of tools for researchers to ensure that their work is in alignment with EDI principles? Well, I think first of all, make sure you understand the difference between sex and gender-based analysis and EDI principles. So sex and gender-based analysis is how you design your experimental protocol or how you design your experiment. EDI principles is how you run your research lab. So it's, do you, you know, are you explicit about um, welcoming everybody into your lab on your website? Do you have a statement on your lab website that says that's, that it's good for everybody? Do you ensure that um, it's a safe place for everybody to work? I actually gave up working in the lab on weekends as a postdoc because of sexual harassment. Um, and so that limited the, you know, I mean, shouldn't really be working on the, on the weekend anyway for work-life balance, but there's sometimes you have to go in and you have to change media on cells or something like that. Um, if people are limited by an environment that's not safe, then they're not able to contribute or they're not able to achieve their full potential or do what it is they need to do. Um, and so it's the, it's, you know, in that case, it's a PI's responsibility to make sure it's a safe environment, but it's also, you can be an ally, you can be a, you can be a, a colleague, who can help those kinds of things. So it depends, the tools and, and um, tips and strategies will depend on where you sit in the environment. There are some things that can be quite explicit and are, are part of um, what leadership should do. Um, if you are within a research group as a graduate student or a postdoc, then I would say things like allyship, uh, micro-sponsorship, understanding what a microaggression is, um, understanding um, the impacts of certain behaviors that feel exclusionary. Um, I've had a lot of discussions with um, 
a few people around, it, should everybody speak English in the lab? Because um, not allowing people to speak their native language could be uh, exclusionary. But there could be some situations where you must be able to speak English because it's a health and safety issue. So being aware of some of those things um, that are specific to people with individuals with, with diverse cultural backgrounds and just um, thinking about those things. And perhaps the biggest thing that we miss is simply asking people what will be useful, asking people what will be helpful. You know, and I think taking the time to say, what would make you feel more included or what are the things that make you feel like you're not included and then starting to address those and taking time to do that and doing it intentionally yeah i think that's great advice i'm going to pull another question if you could explain what you mean by non-traditional recruitment yeah so that's a great question um as well because that came up recently um when some colleagues were just finalizing their insert discovery grants so we have a fairly traditional route for um, uh, recruiting graduate students. Um, we will, they will apply, we will look at their records, we will look at their transcripts, we'll look at their grades, um, and we will look at things like, have they volunteered in the lab, for instance, as a way of, of, of determining whether we'll take them. But then you have to think that volunteering in a lab is only possible if you don't have to go out and work. So volunteer, the ability to volunteer in a lab is actually an indication of some privilege. So maybe thinking about that not being a factor and maybe looking to, um, to individuals who maybe have worked with, with uh, students in, uh, in, in student societies. Have they got leadership qualities? Um, have they been involved in science communication? Do they have good communication skills? <laughs> so look, perhaps looking at things that that maybe um, we have not traditionally looked at and then asking uh, for recommendations. And then often underrepresented groups um, need encouragement. And so going to some of those people that maybe have been recommended and saying, have you thought about graduate school? And then having a conversation as I did with one student once saying, um, well, nobody thinks I can do it. Nobody thinks I can make it through. No, no, nobody in my family has ever gone to university. So, and then having that conversation. So those are sort of non-traditional routes. In terms of hiring people in, um, for positions, then going out and working networks and going out and talking to people directly and repeated interactions. It's not a one-off waiting for the application to come in. It's going out there and saying, yes, you can. You're really good at this. Think about it. So just sort of really broadening the way we think about getting people to come and join us because there are people who are reluctant. There are people who feel like they don't belong. And the way we have traditionally done it is actually a pretty narrow set of criteria that we use. Um, and there are, you know, we need people with all sorts of skill sets um, in science. And so broadening the way we think about that and using different approaches um, I think is, a, is, is the way to go. Our next question, how can we get more public engagement rather than only the underrepresented populations? That is a big challenge. Um, and as I've said many, many times, the burden of responsibility is, does not fall on um, the underrepresented groups. The burden of responsibility for um, affecting change is on, the, on those with power and privilege, whether they be individuals or institutions. Um, really, the way to get... Uh, more public engagement it, by scientists um, is to make it something we value, is to make it something that is rewarded. Um, because when individuals see that there is a value to them, um, then they're much, much more likely to, to exhibit the behaviors you want. Um, and so, you know, much of the outreach that goes on right now is done by women and we don't typically, culturally, traditionally value women's contributions. But if we said that we're now going to include that, for instance, on our NSERC discovery grants or on our CIHR project grants, um, what, you know, describe your activities in public engagement, in, in policy um, um, policy development, um, then I think we would start to see uh, more people um, seeing that as a value and, and beginning to do it. So I think, and, and these are things that, that I and other people are suggesting, that it, it has to be something that is valued, it has to be something that uh, represents um, a core competency 
if you can't do that, if you don't have that skill set, then we're going to hire the person that does have that skill set. Or if you can't do that, or you're not demonstrating public engagement or outreach, then you're ranked lower and we're going to give the money to the person that has the great science, but is also doing the public engagement. Um, and we're kind of heading in that direction, um, but we need to do much more of it. We need to value it as much as we value getting a patent, you know, or giving an invited keynote or whatever, um, which are incredibly biased metrics. Maybe time for one last question here. Can you describe some key misconceptions about EDI best practices? For example, things done with good intentions in relation to EDI, but that in the end have negative effects. Yeah, there's actually quite a lot of work that's been done on this. So there's a fair amount of, of research and scholarship around um, these kinds of things. And I think the biggest misconception, there's a couple of them. One, one is that it's, it's gender binary and it's about fixing women or fixing people of color and it's about fixing them and making them lean in or making them, you know, overcome barriers or making them building up their confidence or if we have, or that it's a pipeline issue. And if we just stuff more in at the bottom, they'll make their way through and that'll fix it. Um, I think the, the idea that somehow the problem is with the people who are in the minority rather than the problem being with the culture and context. Um, and so when we, when we focus on the underrepresented group, um, one of the under, un, unintended consequences can be that they end up feeling more marginalized. Like the fact is that we have to focus on you and do interventions on you means that there's really something wrong with you rather than actually uh, looking at adjusting the culture and context and letting those people simply be themselves. Um, so I think this emphasis that if we have more mentoring programs, um, that'll fix things, fails to address the fact that if you're in a toxic environment and if you're in a culture that says you don't belong, all the mentoring in the world isn't going to make a difference. That's not to say that we don't need to work on structures and systems and processes to support those groups, make sure there are communities in place, make sure there are um, um, support systems in place. Um, but in the absence of also addressing the culture and having the people with the power and privilege and having the dominant group take responsibility for their behavior, you know, all the mentoring programs in the world won't make a difference. So we need to shift that, shift that conversation over to actually it's all on us. It's not on, you know, it's not on the underrepresented group to do all the work. Dr. Ko, thank you very much for sharing your expertise with us. Thank you everyone for tuning in.